Mr. Lutch, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number, please, sir. Donald Lutcher, 210816. Yes, sir, Mr. Lester. Good afternoon. Um, you're here today seeking a commutation of your sentence. Yes, ma'am. In May 1996, in the 32nd Judicial District, Terrebonne Parish, yes, uh, you were sentenced to life for a second degree murder. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Let me uh, acknowledge we have some uh, folks here representing the victim. Uh, we have Tracy Allen and Casey Williams, both whom will be speaking. We also have Michael Trostclair, Tippy Trostclair, Paswana Trostclair, and Lydia Trostclair, all who are here in opposition. Uh, your case this afternoon, um, Mr. Lutcher, has been assigned to Mr. Roche. Uh, he'll be making a presentation and you'll be asked to answer any questions he may have. And I do see, excuse me, the parole projects here too. We'll call on him if you like. Mr. Rishney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Lutcher. How you doing? Good. Uh, Mr. Lutcher, sit back, relax, and we're going to have a conversation, okay? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Madam Chairman. Fellow board members, we have Donald E. Lutcher, DOC number 210816. Mr. Lutcher is here this afternoon seeking a commutation of his sentence for a 1996 conviction for second degree murder in, this, in the stabbing of his wife, Sandra Plus Claire Lutcher on April 19, 1992. He was first convicted in the death of his wife in 1993, but through an appeal to the Louisiana Supreme Court, the court ordered him released and a new trial was ordered in 1995. In January of 1996, he was found guilty again, this time by a jury of his peers, and once again sentenced to life at DOC without benefits of probation, parole, or suspension in sentence. Since his September 96 sentencing, Mr. Lutcher has made two additional appeals to the Louisiana Supreme Court and both were denied. Let me see if I have my facts straight, Mr. Lutcher. In January of 20. I'm sorry, in January of 1996, you were released by code order, is that correct? Uh, I was still in I was still in jail, but I never was released. I was still okay. in jail. So this release is to go back to your parish for the retrial. Yeah, back to the parish. But you were never released. Never released. Okay. And you didn't go back into DOC custody until your sentencing in September of 1996. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So basically, you've been incarcerated for about 31 years. 31 years. Okay, great. Uh, let me get back to my report. Okay. Mr. Lutcher, you You've given different versions of the events of April 19, 1992. You gave a different event back in 92 when you said you were at a Gaither shop in Gibson, Louisiana, and Miss Sandra was at Carmen Sweet Shop, and you were on a telephone, and uh, 
So you hitchhike to Highway 190 near Thomas Group Cap, which was a ballroom, and you walk to the ballroom. And when you got to the sweet shop, you didn't go in to get your wife. There was a young lady by the name of Loretta who was outside on the sweet shop, and you asked her to go in. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Why didn't you go into the ballroom? At that time, I didn't, I didn't really feel I needed to go in there. You wanted to talk to your wife, so your wife was in the in the sweet shop. Why didn't you go in? That that uh, I just didn't choose not to go in. Okay. Yeah. And when your wife came out, you talked about thirty minutes in front of the uh, sweet shop, yes, and sir. then then you walked down to a trailer, which was a short distance. And you talked for another 30 minutes. Am I right? Yes, sir. During your conversation, her brother, John Cusclair, and a guy named Greg walked up, and you said in the police report when you were arrested, when they walked up, they had their hands in their pocket, and you felt threatened. Is that about right? Yes, sir. Why did you feel threatened? Well, at the time it happened, I was I was drinking and I knew we had got into it a long time ago, so I figured they were gonna get into it, we were gonna get into it again. Yeah, but why would why would you be threatened? Because her brother walked up and a friend of her brother's name, Greg, yeah. walked up, had their hands in the pocket, you didn't see a weapon. Why did you feel threatened? It's just, I guess, just, uh, I don't know how to explain that word. What I'm trying to say, it just happened like that. Okay. So, yeah, you felt threatened. Threat. Yeah. So, you had an open pocket knife that you said that you always carried when you were walking somewhere. Yes, sir. And you pulled the knife out and you stabbed your wife because she was the closest person to you. That's your words. Yes, sir. Why, why would you stab your wife when you were threatened by her brother and a guy named Greg? Well, I guess you could say I was trying to like scare them off, and maybe I thought maybe that would blow them off, scare them off by me by doing stabbing, that. By stabbing your wife, I'm gonna use your words. Yeah. Maybe I stabbed her once, maybe I stabbed her twice, maybe it was three or more times. Yeah. How many times you stabbed your wife? Two, about three. So, so I would imagine that did scare her brother off. He just stabbed his sister, and so he ran away. Yeah, yes, sir. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. Now, at the time you were arrested walking down Highway 90, you didn't have a shirt on. Why? Hmm. That, that, uh, it may sound weird, but that I don't remember not even having a shirt off. Okay. You had bad jeans on and you had, you were bare chested. Mm -hmm. And the police arrested you on Highway 190. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Highway 90. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, Then in April of 2021, you told a parole officer that you were living in Houston, Texas, and that you came back from Houston 
try to talk your wife in to come to Houston to live with you and your family. Is that correct? Yes, sir. What a different story 30 years later. Uh, uh, you said you got in an argument with your wife. You got upset because she was seeing another man and you stabbed her to death. Yes, sir. Those are two completely different stories. Well, uh, what's the Tell us, tell this panel what the truth is. All right. Well, I got drunk that night and I went to the trail house or wherever we was. We got into an argument and one thing led to another and I stabbed him and I took off down the road. And so, the second, out, story, the second story is the true story. The second story is the true story. The first one is my delight. When I first got picked up or wherever they got with me, I was trying to throw it off or get out. And that's, I came up with the right story. Just, just for information purposes, why would a person carry an open pocket knife in his pocket Every time he took a walk. Well, I had, how should I should put it, I had a reputation of carrying a knife, and people knew that. So I always carried a knife in my pocket, like for my protection. But it wouldn't mess with you. Yeah, because that was, that was my reputation I had, carrying a knife. That's not a good reputation, Mr. Lutcher. Well, at the time, I thought it was. Okay, okay. Uh, Mr. Lutcher is currently 60 years old and he was 29 at the time he murdered his wife. He's been incarcerated for 31 years. Mr. Lutcher, there is some indication in my documents you had pending charges at the time you murdered your wife. Is that right? Oh, uh, okay. I couldn't that, remember that. Mm -hmm. Okay, defending charges, you were arrested for disturbing the peace by intoxication and entering and remanding on land after being forbidden. And you were arrested and those charges were pending at the time you murdered your wife. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Why were you in Houston, Texas when you had pending charges in Louisiana? So I just I just went to stay there, I guess. But I didn't really didn't really know I had a charges pending when I left Louisiana. So Those charges were dismissed when you were convicted of murdering your wife. Okay. Mr. Lutcher has an extensive criminal history. He's been arrested as an adult 10 times. Six of those arrests involve violence, four misdemeanor convictions, and one felony conviction. Our position in this case comes from the 33rd JDC District Attorney's Office in Terrebonne Parish and the Terrebonne Parish Sheriff's Office. Multiple members of the victim family are adamantly opposed to any clemency. Michael, the victim's brother, Lori, the victim's sister, the victim's two daughters, Tiffany, <laughs> uh, Trust Claire, and Tracy Allen, are adamantly opposed. Mr. Lutcher has a low 
risk assessment. He just enrolled in victim awareness and thinking for a change in March of 23. Why did you wait so long? You've been incarcerated for 31 years and you just two months ago and probably hadn't completed victim awareness and thinking for a change. Why did you? Why, why did you wait? At the time where I was in another another part of the prison, I was taking other classes, and I really didn't think I needed victim awareness and thinking for a change. So I ended up taking a bunch of other classes and other programs that the prison you know, required us to take. So I took all of them. Good did you think it was important to take victim awareness when you killed your wife? And, uh, and children, our children are mostly affected by your crime? Well, at that time when I was arrested, I wasn't thinking about victim awareness and nothing like that. Then mm -hmm. I got, when I got up into in my incarceration, I said, well, it's time for me to change. And that's when I started taking all the classes. And when I got to another state of prison, they offer me victim awareness and take it for a change. So I got off into it. How long have you been uh, housed at Louisiana State Penitentiary? Sir? How long have you been housed at Louisiana State Penitentiary? <clears throat> oh, about 20 or 25 years. Okay. So give or, take, give, or, give or take. So, so you've been at Angola for at least 25 years. <clears throat> yes, sir. Could it be you just enrolled in classes because you knew this hearing was coming up and you wanted to make sure that you had some programs under your belt? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Like I said, I didn't I didn't really think about that class, those classes. I was thinking about the other programs I was in. Okay. So I was really thinking about those classes. <laughs> tell and me really... why. Tell me why an individual has been incarcerated for thirty-one years. He has no GED. He has no high school diploma. Why? But each time I get into the class and get further, further, I seem like I can't make it. So I just decide I'm not gonna get back into it no more. How many times have you enrolled in GED classes? I enrolled one, two, about four times. Did you finish the literacy program? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's go to your institutional record. Uh, yes, sir. You've been in state custody for about 20, 27 years, but overall you've been incarcerated for 31 years. I see why you're still on the waiting list for substance abuse. Have you taken any substance abuse treatment or education in the last 31 years? Yes, sir. Tell me I've, about it. I've been a New Hope. I've been a New Hope class. And uh, I've been a substance abuse. I've been a substance abuse man. The institutional record says that you're on a waiting list for substance abuse. All right. Yeah, I've been there. So. Okay. I'm going to call out some courses. <laughs> Have you completed living in balance? Uh, Have you completed living in balance? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Have you completed living in balance? I, bar I barely could hear him. Have you completed living in balance? No, sir, I'm still in there. I'm in there. Warren, Warren, Warren Ambo? Yes, sir. He has, not, he has not completed living in balance. Celebrate recovery. Uh, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Louisiana Risk Management. No, sir. 
What program has he completed, Warden? He only completed anger management. Uh, he did healthcare early training and he did a point lookout project. Um, the last time he was enrolled in GED was in uh, 2016, September 2016, and um, he dropped the course for personal and voluntary reasons. And he do have hey, a well, I will get back to you later, Warden. Um, Mr. Lutcher. Yes, sir. And I will tell you quite frankly, you have a, you like the good time programming that you need for your rehabilitation. You've been incarcerated 31 years, and I know sometimes things get in your way, but you've been at a state institution for 25 plus years, and you should have more programs than you have now. Uh, that's, uh, let's see. He's housed in minimum custody. He only has four disciplinary write ups in 31 years of incarceration. And that's a pretty good record. Uh, Mr. Lachi, what was your last disciplinary write up? Well, November 2005. Yeah. And that's the only class B write up you have. All your other write ups are class A. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I see we, you worked for prison enterprises. How long did you work for prison enterprises? Stayed there about a, about a year, six months. Okay. And are you a uh, health care orderly now? No, sir. What's your, what's your present job assignment? I work on death row. I'm a chair walker. A chair walker, okay. Uh, tell me about your organization, The Wonders of Joy. What is that? That was a program that they had, they came up with, a, a club that came up with that was just a regular club. Well, was teaching school and everything, but nothing really applied to it, so they just left it alone. So they okay. just started, just started, just running it like a club. Okay, New Hope Group. That's where I learned my my twelve step program, and that's when they they, they taught me how to do a control my alcohol. How to okay. Stop. Yeah. Now. Question 25A of the annual report says, have you ever been revoked? And it states, the offender was on probation when he committed his charge. So you are on probation, but for pending charges, and you are living in Houston, Texas. And I, I still don't understand that, but I'll leave that alone. Tell me about your transition plan. What do you plan to work and what do you plan to live? Well, my, my transition plan is I'm in hospice right now and I I take care of a lot the people that's dying. So my plan is to get out and get in the hospice program and help the people that's dying that don't have nobody, even though they have somebody, they help them out too. So I'm able okay. to share with them. But I just asked you, were you a hospice or and you said no? No, I'm a hospice caregiver. Hospice all in caregiver is two different things. Hospice, okay. Yeah. I thought you said you were a chair walker. I'm a chair walker at death row. I do my hospice work volunteer. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, how many hours a week do you spend in hospitals? Well, I go like the weekend and I'll stay like four, five hours. Like this morning, I went at two o'clock and I stayed till seven. Then I came over here to go to the board. I have a okay. patient I sit with that's dying, so I go sit with them. So. Very good. 
and your institutional record is more fair. And the reason it's more fair because the classification officer says you have a great, you have great programs, but you're lacking in educational and vocational programming. You need to start working towards that GED gets some type of education. Sometimes it's a little bit more difficult for one person than the other person. But if you put your mind to it, I would suggest that you get back into the GED program. Yes, sir. Uh, let me get back to my report. So let's talk about drugs and alcohol. When when did you start using drugs? Well, I never used drugs, but I drank a lot. I was drinking a lot of alcohol. You never you never used marijuana? No, sir. No drugs of any kind. No, sir. Okay, no, your, sir. your your demon was alcohol. My demon was the alcohol. And when did you start abusing alcohol? I guess I was about 10 years old and me and my little, my little buddies used to hang out and we used to go to the store. We couldn't buy no alcohol, so we'll get somebody else to buy the little bottle and we'll go inside the store and drink it. And that's when I started drinking. And I was drinking regular. And like, I was drinking so regular, like when I got older, alcohol became part of my life. Everything I did was based on alcohol. I had a job, I was drinking. I would go out, I was drinking. Party, I was drinking. Wherever I went, I had something to drink. If I go to sleep at night, I wake up drinking. Mr. Lutcher. Yes, sir. How, how long were you married to Miss Sandra? About two or three years. So she knew about your alcohol problem? Yes, sir. Everybody that knew me knew about my alcohol problem. They know I love to drink. But I had wrecks and everything. Now you had, you had some DWI. Yes, sir. Now, why were you and Ms. Sandra separated? No, uh, I guess we just decided to separate. So. Let me ask you again, why were you and your wife separated? Oh, uh, I really don't have the answer to that. We just separated. Okay. But you were trying to talk her back to go to yes. Houston, Texas with you. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. If and when you release, what is your ongoing sobriety plan? How do you plan to stay away from alcohol? Well, it's, it's not how do you stay away from it, how you just don't get off into it. That's the thing. I won't be trying to drink no more because I know what it did me and I know what it do people. So I'm going to have try to control that. And you know, like the like the steps say, you know, come to believe the greater power within you can help restore back to sanity. So that's what I'm gonna be trying to do. Stay away from the alcohol, not go to it. So you're not an alcoholic anymore, right? Uh no, 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 I don't drink no more. Not since I've been incarcerated. Are you an alcoholic? When I before I got incarcerated, yes, sir. Are you an alcoholic, Mr. Oh, no, sir, not right now. So you need some substance abuse education, and you probably need some substance abuse treatment because once an alcoholic, you'll always be an alcoholic. Okay. It's a lifelong disease that you have to treat Constantly. All right. Warren Ambo, you have an additional comments, concerns, remarks, or observations. 
No, sir, I don't. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Chairman, I do have a recommendation and I will share with my fellow board member at the conclusion of this interview. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Um, we'll hear support. Could we, Mr. Hunt? Hello, Andrew Hundley with Louisiana Parole Project, uh, confirming that uh, Mr. Letcher is a client of our organization. Um, the reason that we've decided to take Mr. Letcher on as a client uh, is because he's been incarcerated for around three decades. Uh, only one high court write up during his incarceration uh, showing uh, that he can comply with rules and expectations. Uh, Class A trustee, but uh, most especially, we were impressed with his maturity uh, and, and what's he, what he's demonstrated as a hospice volunteer and his community service and involvement with the Point Lookout Project. If he would be released, uh, we would provide him with reentry support immediately after his release. We would assist him with his sobriety, ensure that he had mental health and substance abuse assessment, and then he would have the tools necessary. To, um, to follow up with the, whatever those recommendations are, but also give him long-term case management by a peer mentor and help him with his reentry into the community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have here speaking uh, in opposition. Could we hear from Tracy Allen? I'm here. Go ahead. Yes, my name is Tracy Allen. I'm Sandra Trust Claire's middle child. My thing is, um, when he spoke about them being separated, he didn't know why they were separated. She left him because he was abusive. And he took her life because he, she didn't want to go back. Leaving her with three kids nieces, nephews that she don't even know, grandkids that she don't even know. And for him to want to be left paroled out, I don't think so. My family went through a lot and she didn't deserve what she had. She didn't deserve it. And to let you know, she did leave her mark here on earth. And you speaking to her. Looks, my mom was small. You wasn't scared. You did that because that's what you wanted to do. And I know my family that's here, over there that's willing to speak, um, they feel the same way. You took something special from all of us, a mother, an aunt, a grandmother, friend, everybody loved for no reason at all. And the end, Mike, what I have to say is don't grant him the parole because he don't deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Tracy Williams here. I don't know if y'all just might go on. Can you speak loud? Yeah. Okay. Right. So our mother Sarah and Trust Lab was taken away from us. Under horrendous circumstances on April 19th of 1992, where three surviving now adult daughters are tormented daily at the thought of what she endured in the last moments of her life. It plays out in our minds constantly, as well. We recall and remind and we're reminded of the fatal sequence of that event. We wonder when our mother realized she would be in mortal danger. We wonder what her murderer said to her as he delivered 28 stab wounds, with two of those delivered with so much force 
that it punctured through her frail frame from her back to the front. Or did he realize she was in, or did she realize she was in imminent danger as he delivered that fatal style wound to her windpipe? We will forever be reminded of uh sorry. We will forever wonder for how long was she conscious, knowing she would die and leave her children without tangible love. Did he ever think about the future lives that his actions are thinking? Her three daughters, her mother, siblings, other relatives, the community that would be left to question the events of that day over and over and over. Due to his actions, I must have missed high school graduations, college graduations, when she would never scared to say how proud she was. She has missed out on being a grandmother to find beautiful grandchildren. Grandchildren was denied the experience of the grandmother being part of their lives. They were denied kisses and hugs and prayers. The sequences of events on April 19, 1992, our mother could not be and would not be present in or in our milestone events, nor for the future generation. Our mother is gone, we're broken. She was precious. It was our grandmother's oldest daughter. The unbearable grief surrounds this event. Um, it's far reaching and devastating on our family and the help. Our grandmother died with a, heart, a broken heart, not understanding why our daughter was murdered. Her brother also succumbed to death by a broken heart, blaming himself for his youthful inability to save his dear sister from being murdered. Our overwhelming sorrow comes in waves, in forms of panic, and not in it. We can never talk to her, we can never hold her, we can never be held by her, and never be part of her life. We see closeness to our mother, we have to visit a grave site. We must sit in silence and wait for our sorrows to dissipate. We listen for angels to whisper so we can move forward. So his family should be capable to visit him in prison, write him letters, or receive phone calls, and not at his grave site. <clears throat> our lives will never be the same. Her death leaves an aching in our lives that we can never be through. The sleepless nights are too numerous to count. The, night the nightmares are too painful to the camp. The endless streams of tears haven't stopped, nor will they any time soon. His self of 1992, of April 19, 1992, devastated our family for and further reaching consequences. His selfish act destroyed her mother and her siblings. Our mother's collided a wound for her infectious smile and pleasant nature. However, we've been robbed of it since April 19. Instead, we hold tight to memories of what might happen. And we try to move forward, but a tremendous one will never be filled, and the heartbreak will never go away. We're sure that life in jail is hell. However, the punishment is not comparable to the punishment we've endured for the last 31 years. Trying to wrap our heads and hearts around not having a mother in our lives because she was murdered, and she attempted to walk away from an abusive husband, an abusive man, and an abusive marriage. Not long ago, Sandra, trust her youngest daughter, posted her mother's story on social media and hoped to just straighten someone that's trying to walk away from an abusive partner. And one of the defendant's sister had the nerve to tell us to get over it. It's been 30 years and we need to move on. How callous is that? Ms. Williams, can you wrap it up? Please? Yes. Um, but how can we move on without a mother, without the thought that the defendant was outraged enough? So right out of her that she attempted to walk away. They said time heals all wounds, but our family would say the statement is not true. Because 31 years, our family has tried to heal from 28 style wounds that Sandra plus Flex is not too late. In closing, we gather today to determine that the defendant should be determined to uh, allowed to go to his home to his family, to live a new life in a world where we are still completely from wounds. As Peter stated, we're talking to them and it's not that she is doing. We say no and we thank you for your time and consideration.
All right, Mr. Lutcher, is there a brief statement you'd like to make before we vote? Uh, I had wrote a, a, a accountable letter for my for my actions to the family, and I'd like to read if it's all right. Uh, my name is Donald Lutcher. I'm writing this letter to share and complete understanding of the crime I committed on April the 19th, 1992, when I took the life of Sandra Trust Claire Lutcher. I am very remorseful for my action and for what I've done. And, and there was no right found in my action for taking her life away from her family, relatives, and friends and community. I apologize for the hurt and pain I've caused you all. I realize that you all have suffered because of my terrible mistake. I decided to take Sandra's life. Since my incarcerator, I've learned to take full responsibility for my actions through educating myself and participating in the state requirement courses. These programs have helped me to become a better man and ensure that this type of incident will never happen again. I am participating in substance abuse and taught me how to control my addiction and behavior. I further educate my learning by how to bring my anger under control by taking the course of anger management, which have shown me now how to stay control of my anger and turn my anger into a positive situation by using, using different, sorry about that. I have learned from educating myself with one of the basic tools of knowledge of being accountable for my action and learning that life I took was caused, caused everyone so much pain and hurt that can now be replaced. I ever there are no justification for my action and all what I did to Ms. Sandra Lutcher. And I was wrong for that. Again, I do apologize for all the hurt I have caused to you and I have to live with this for the rest of my life. Thank you for taking your time to taking your time to let me read this letter. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Here to vote. Here. Mr. Lutcher, based upon adamant opposition, the victim's family expressed opposition, opposition from the entire legal community, the judge, the DA's office, law enforcement, the extensive criminal background, and a light a rehabilitated program, my vote is and recommendation is to deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Mirabella. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lutcher, <clears throat> uh, you probably need some more programs, but you've done a lot of things while you've been in prison. I'm very impressed with your hospice volunteer work, uh, your cheer walker. You, you've done anger management. You, you've done a lot of work while you've been in prison. The disciplinary record has been excellent. Uh, I'm willing to take a chance on you. You've got a low risk. Um, my vote would be today to uh, grant, to recommend to the governor that he grant a commutation for 99 years. Mr. Freeman? Uh, my vote today. You know, if you had more substance abuse treatment, it would be different. But I, I really feel the alcohol is the main enticer behind your action. It's what causes you temper. And uh, quite frankly, I think it is what led to a lot of the disappointments in your life. So my vote today is denied to deny due to victim opposition and law enforcement. Mrs. Jackson? Uh, Ms. Lester, I, I do wish you had um, involved yourself in some more programming. I do understand some of the things that you said. Um, but I don't think you're ready yet. You've done some good things, and I want to commend you on those things. I want you to be part. But I just think today is not the day. I think there's some more that you could do. So I'd love to. All right, um, Mr. Lutcher, you've received one favorable vote. Three that were not favorable, so you didn't get the vote you needed. Uh, today, your uh, application for clemency is denied. So, good luck to you.
Mr. Mirabella surprised me there. I'll tell you that. You you guys want to know something? The beginning of this hearing, it, it's about for me. It's not. It's about taking accountability, right? It's about being honest with what he's done. It's about I didn't see any of that. And I didn't see the board hold him accountable to that either, really. I mean, at the beginning, they, he starts off with the story of there was three of them coming to me. And I was scared, so I stabbed my wife to scare them. It's like, first of all, it's like, what an what an insane thing to 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 like that you would even think that that would make you look better than the truth. There's something missing up there. That is not who. Like, why would that? That's his excuse. That's the that's the lie that he told to make himself look better. Look at that's his perspective. That's there's something wrong. I know that's not what happened. We have the court transcript. Then he said that he stabbed her maybe three or four times. Well, how about twenty eight? There were twenty eight attack marks on her body, according to the report. There were two that the blade had gone through both sides of her body. It was pushed so hard. And he slit her throat. This was a vicious, monstrous attack. The idea of him getting out is scary. So here's the details. The defendant and his wife, Sandra, Sandra Trosclair, lecture the victim, lived together in Texas until November 1991 when the victim went to Gibson, Louisiana to check on her ailing mother. While the victim was in Louisiana, she started seeing another man. In April 1992, the defendant came. So, so this is November 91, okay? This is all the way down now. Let's fast forward to April 92. So it's been a while. The defendant came to Gibson after visiting... When the vic with the victim, he believed that, and he believed he'd be getting back together. On the evening of April 19, 1992, the defendant went to see the victim. He met her outside a lounge near her trailer. They spoke for about five or ten minutes. A woman who lived nearby overheard the defendant ask the victim to return to Houston to live with him. So she left, like what the daughter said, she left also because he was being abusive, right? So she needs to get out of there. She went to go visit the mom. It's been a long time. It's been like a year. The <coughs> then he shows up. And she responded that she did not want to be with him. She straight up said, I don't want to be with you. The woman did not consider that the conversation to be violent. When the defendant and the victim finished talking, she went back into the lounge and the defendant went behind her trailer. Sometime after going back into the lounge, the victim asked her brother, John Roy, to go with her to check on her trailer because she was nervous, I guess. They walked to the trailer, went inside, and found everything to be in order. After the victim closed the door to leave, the defendant ran from behind the trailer. So he's hiding behind the trailer with a knife. This isn't even like... In the heat of the moment stuff. This is now premeditated. He's hiding behind the trailer for her to get back. After he's rejected, he's hiding behind the trailer for her. So, and she knew something was up. She had her brother come with him, okay? Once the victim closed the door, the defendant ran from behind with a knife, with John described as long as a straight blade. He told the uh, so Truscular told the victim to run, and he started running to the lounge to get help. Oh, man, that, he probably beats himself up over that. He runs to the lounge to get help. As the victim ran, the defendant stabbed her in the back. So she's running. He stabs her in the back. When she fell to the ground, the defendant continued to stab her. While the defendant was chasing and stabbing the victim, he said things like, Why you wrote him that letter? 
Why are you telling him that you love him? The victim died from the stab wounds. That's terrible. Uh, and I just think about it. She's with her brother. And the brother runs away to the lounge. And that's some... Um, that's got to be so tough on him. You know, I get he's running to get help, but... Uh... We all we all don't know how we'd act in that situation. Um, but it's probably try to find the closest weapon and 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 get between you and your sister and the crazy guy because he's a coward, you know. I don't know that he'd fight another man. He's just a coward. The defendant fled from the scene on foot. Shortly after the offense, De Deputy Randy of the Terrebonne Parish Sheriff's Office located, you know, there are no cell phones. So, but you know, then you should both run to the, to the bar, but it, things happen so quickly. I just, just don't know. I'm not, I'm not placing anything. I'm just saying it's, it makes, it makes my stomach lurch a little bit there. Um, Located the, the, so they located the defendant and arrested him. During the search of the defendant's person, the deputy seized a pocket knife. After being advised of his rights, the defendant told the deputy he had just left his wife's residence after stabbing her. He said he stabbed his wife because she was seeing another man. And remember, this isn't like, this isn't even like something where he comes home and finds this out. She left the state. They've been gone for like a year. They, he left her for, you know, this isn't, you know, she would, he, he, he would have known, of course, he would have been with other people. You should all probably, you know, only assume, right? They're, they're separated, living in different states, um, and divorced and all, but, but, but I guess, but I guess, you know, except for going through the actual proceeding. When the deputy asked the defendant what weapon he used. The defendant pointed to the pocket knife. An investigator from the district attorney's office asked the defendant why he killed his wife, and the defendant said, I had to kill her. I just had to kill her. The defendant was interviewed in more detail during a taped statement at the sheriff's office. He told law enforcement officers he spoke to the victim by phone while she was at the lounge. The conversation she said she was mad at him. He then went to the lounge and had somebody ask her to come outside to talk to him. When she did, they spoke, but did not argue. The defendant claimed that during his conversation with the victim, the victim's brother, Johnny, and Gregory Johnson, the victim's boyfriend, walked up. Oh, so the victim's boyfriend is there. When the defendant, oh, no, no, this is his story. Okay. When the defendant saw the men, he took out his pocket knife because he and Gregory had fought before. The defendant then used the knife to stab the victim. Right? This is the story he, he shared today. So it's interesting that he reverted back to this story. He reverted back to this initial story that he gave, what, 31 years ago or something? At his parole hearing. Before he came back to the truth. When the officer asked him why he stabbed the victim, he said he did not know. He denied cutting the victim's throat, and he said that he did not remember how many times he stabbed her. He said he thought he stabbed her only two or three times. This is, again, it's, it's like he's reverting... He's reverting to this story from 31 years ago. You know, there's something about psychology that we could probably, you know, psychologists could tap into. But the idea that this is what he told the detectives 31 years ago, and then 31 years later at his uh, commutation hearing, he says basically the same story. When an officer asked if he killed her because she was at the bar with her boyfriend at the time, when he thought they were getting back together, the defendant agreed they might have been this reason. The defendant denied that he had seen the victim with her boyfriend at the lounge. The defendant said he had been drinking since early in the morning, was angry and drunk when the murder occurred. According to the pathologist who performed the autopsy, the victim had 28 wounds to her body and bled to death as a result of those wounds. Two of the wounds were potentially fatal. 
one which severed her windpipe and cut into an artery, and another in the mid-chest which penetrated a major vessel leading from the heart. Because of the two wounds on the victim's back appeared to be exit wounds, the pathologist believed the victim was stabbed all the way through. Can you imagine? I don't know if she was, she, his, her daughter said she was small, and it's a pocket knife. But I don't, I mean, I guess he, he did that much violence. So when all, there was an exit wound. From front to back. To these two wounds, the pathologist considered wounds on the victim's hands, forearms, and arms to be defensive wounds. To assist in proving intent to kill, the state introduced testimony concerning a prior incident in which the defendant threatened to kill the victim. During December 1991, the victim sometimes stayed at the home of Betty Rufin, Johnson's mother. The defendant came to Louisiana to visit them about 3 p.m. December 10, 1991. The defendant came to the house. We wanted the victim to come outside. The victim was not coming outside and asked to leave, but I'll be back, he said. Oh, when Riffin told the victim he's not coming, the defendant said that the female dog must die. I'm just avoiding the curse word, the B word, must die. The defendant also told Ruffin that he was to remain at her house. Ruffin again called. So they're just, they're just showing a history of violence. Um, he described the various drinks. He also testified that he had seen the victim had been married for seven and a half years. For the last five years of the marriage, they lived in Houston. When the defendant came, I need to get going soon. I have to go to the gym. Um, I wonder why he got a second trial. Sure is not impartial. Sure will not accept it was given in court. To prove to prove there has been an error in reverse the conviction need only show one. Was this the appeal that he got a second trial? Let's see what the end of it is. Um, oh, in this section, defendant also argues Mosley's testimony regarding 1991 was inadmissible because of the previous charge. This issue is related to argument, second arguments. I, you know, I'm not 100% sure if this is the second trial or the first trial that we're looking at here. Um... I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyways, outside of that legal technicality, I, I again, it's it comes, it comes back to, to uh, I just he, he again, there's like no sense of remorse. He lied right here on this commutation hearing. Completely lied. Um, then after a little bit of pressure, he goes back and he can't really, and he's still lying. He can't really, he's not really, really stating why it is that he did this. And here it is really, he's a man that was, that's a coward that attacked, uh, his wife, estranged wife at the time, because she didn't want to be with him. And he was violent. You heard it from his daughters and it's just someone like that should not get, get out. I, I couldn't believe Mr. Mirabella said, sure. And Mr. Mirabella out of all people, I mean, he he hasn't done the he only started doing the programs when he thought he had a chance of getting out too i i, I just i don't really see it um it didn't seem that bright 
who knows that he gets out, starts drinking again, where his anger will lead him. I, so I, I just, for those reasons, I would uh, deny his his commutation. You got to you got to start by being honest. But that's just my point of view. Love to hear yours. Also thought that his, the daughter spoke very elegantly. You know, he speaks so concisely. Um, she was the middle child. She says she, her, her speech stuck out to me. And uh, I don't know if it was actually her, if they were, if it's her father or just a stepfather, but every five years she's going to have to come back. With that, I'll let you go.